Okay, great. Why don't we get started? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Global Impact of Eye Health session today. My name is Paul Chan, and I will be moderating this session. Uh, I would like to introduce our presenters for this session, Ambassador Walton Webson and Carolyn Casey. Ambassador Webson is the permanent representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations, co-chair of the United Friends of Vision Group, and chair of the Alliance of Small Island States. Ms. Casey is the current president of the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness and is the businesswoman and activist behind the Valuable 500, the world's largest CEO collective and business movement for disability inclusion. Before we start our session, I wanted to inform our audience that you can submit questions through the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of your screen. We will respond to as many questions as time allows at the end of the session. Additionally, a copy of the presentation is available on the iSummit website and recordings will be available in the next week or so. I would now like to welcome Ambassador Webson. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much to the organizers of this event. It is truly an honor to have the opportunity to share some thoughts and share some ideas on the and let you know a little bit on of the insight on the work that we are doing here at the United Nations and its impact on the broader global community in the area of eye health. Um, and we would welcome questions um, after. Let me begin by giving you a little bit of background. Um, as to my motivation in getting into this project at the United Nations, because while we do have a history of having friends, friends of this or friends of that, having the friends of vision, something that I founded with and has seen this grow with colleagues. When I got in, we decided firstly to address some of the questions of disability and we were able in the first year, year and a half, to um, address the questions first dealing with communications for persons who are deaf and had a hearing relating to sign language. We got that done and the 23rd of September is declared as International Sign Language Day. We then went on to address the question of braille communications for persons who are blind and those who read braille. And we were able to get Louis Braille Day on um, January 3rd to be declared as an international day. We then um, worked with the organizing <clears throat> of a permanent steering committee within the UN system to deal with issues of disability within the UN itself. And we addressed that and managed that. And then working with colleagues from civil society, we were able to establish a foundation to build on growing the friends of vision. Now, I think this is important because I had um, a colleague, a friend of mine in the United Kingdom ask me the question, why, we, why governments and the international um, community did not take um, blindness prevention more seriously in the discussion on health and universal health? And my answer was fairly simple. I said, well, because when you speak of blindness prevention, the first thing that the knee jerk response is you're speaking of disability. And for me, eye health is not a disability issue, it's a health issue. Whether you, um, eye, eye diseases, eye injury, eye accidents, are health traumas and accidents and injuries, and uh, the diseases are health related issues, all can lead to a disability. So, uh, so, so too can a lot of other, other um, diseases or injuries. But the first issue is what is your health services that is available to address the question of this particular health challenge? And so it, I, I suggested to my colleague and friend that we might begin to be speaking more of eye health issues rather than blindness prevention issues. And 
out and we should find a different response because language determines the way you respond to things and it determines how you think of, of, of particular matters. So we went on to form the Friends of Vision and out of that, we very shortly after was able to get in the Universal Declaration on, on, the, 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 on, the, on Health for the very first time, language in the Universal Declaration on eye health. And I remember it well because we debated it long and I was one of the co-chairs who worked with them and getting that language into the, into the resolution that dealt with, um, un, with un, universal health. Having done that, we then decided it was very useful if we could work towards a, a, a standalone resolution on eye health. We went about doing that and we thought that it would be rather easy However, we found out that nothing in the United Nations is easy, even when speaking about anything, even talk. So we were able, however, with much compromise and much discussion, for some of the same reasons I said, when we talked about eye health, people thought of disability and said, no, we're speaking about a health issue here. And we were able to get, however, a resolution last July, July of 2021, into the United Nations framework that began to address the issues of eye health within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is rather important because the SDGs is the promise that the global community has made to the world of leaving no one behind. And I take that seriously myself, but the SDGs is the, is the target and 2030 is the target that we believe, or we, we but prior to COVID-19, that we all believe we will be able to achieve a significant global transformation in addressing issues of poverty, health, hunger, um, and, and 17 targets and 169 different indicators to, to assess those targets. Well, of course, COVID-19 has set back many states, especially developing states in that goal. And we will see where we go. Um, in moving, however, having done the resolution, we now have to move that forward. And it's not just a resolution that stands on paper. So we have to move that forward and we have to look at the issues that affect many countries around our globe. And we have to see that the, the, the issue of eye health, predominantly the countries that there are too many people, nearly a billion persons in our globe, most of whom live in developing countries who are suffering um, from needlessly from eye health diseases and who have gone blind or have significant vision loss needlessly because of lack of services and care in eye health. So I, 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 I want to, to propose then that in looking at that resolution, we need all hands on deck. We need all of you in the audience. We need all of you as organizers to work with us to make this resolution a living document and not a document that is passed and put on a shelf. We need to provide, um, support to governments, and this is where you stand. But both civil society and government have to work together to make eye health a universal, a part of the universal health package. And whether it is assessment for glasses, or it is assessment within, or it is major um, eye health surgery and challenges, we need to do that. Vision Impairment or eye health is a universal challenge that most people will express in their lives, and we need to make sure that people understand that. Avoidable uh, um, vision loss, however, it can be both a cause and a consequence of, of entrenched inequalities 
and that's the linking with the um, SDGs. The burden of blindness, we know disproportionately affects low and middle income countries. And these countries are primarily in developing, in the, what we might call develop, developing or the developing world. Unaddressed eye health challenges obstructs a, a, a state's ability to, um, to, to eradicate poverty, which deals with SDG 2 in all its forms and end discrimination and, um, and, and exclusion in, and help to reduce inequalities um, and, and the vulnerabilities of leaving no one behind. People are needlessly left behind, and, it, and, 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 and this undermines the potential of individuals and countries' shared progress towards achieving the SDGs. Um, the, 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 the resolution we have, which some I hope you have seen, is aimed at addressing that. 90% of those affected by vision loss or impaired um, or, 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 or vision impairment, if you might, live in low and middle income countries. And we need, um, and those MIC or middle income countries uh, are the countries to which you might want to pay a lot of attention to for blindness uh, up, in, uh, up, to, up to 90 times higher in Western, Western Sahara, in West Sahara Africa than it is in, in less than North America. And the UN with a, 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 an eye health program in low and middle income countries, we ask UN agencies to work with civil society so we can address that. The United Nations resolution on, on vision and provides a paradigm shift, I believe, to address poverty and inequality and linked vision loss. It, be, it commits the, in the international community to helping the 1.1 billion people with, eye, with vision loss who currently lack eye health services by, by to, to reach um, the, the goal of leaving no one behind by 2030. In addressing this, we will be creating new expectations for countries, we'll be looking at new national government challenges and be looking at putting more people back into the economies of, of many societies. We also link very clearly eye health and vision loss with education. And we have some opportunities and we have to take those opportunities as we advance the SDGs. This year, the Secretary General of the United Nations will be having an educational summit. And we have to, while, while we will address the questions of education because education was hard hit by the pandemic, we must also look at the well-being of the students, the learners, if you might. And those students' well-being who are particularly struggling with because they're in environments where there are poor services for eye health, we need to be sure that these, these um, students have access to the services that will help to increase their capacity for learning and help to increase their opportunities within the societies in which they live. We also recognize that the new development that develop the, the need in developed countries to transfer technology to developing countries is, 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 is also very important as actor in order to access eye health services. The transfer of technology is another very important um, tool that is um, in the, the SDGs. And we speak of transfer of technology from developed to developing countries because we need to be able to use the technology that is so available in, in the developed world to be able to assist in addressing the question, some of these questions in developing countries. I know we often in development try to speak 
only of the things that we have in that country, but we need to use, because technology has become such a part of our life in transforming exactly how we work, as we are doing here now today, we can attract hundreds of people listening to us because of that. But because of that, we need to be able to use the technology in helping medical services and the health services in developing countries to reduce the challenges that, that they face. And some of those challenges might be incurred because of distances. Some of them are because countries are too poor to host the kind of technology in their country. But if we use modern transport, not old technology, but new technology, and we allow countries to be, to be, to be trained with them, you, the differences would be stark in the, in, the, in, in, in the way we would have changed the world in addressing the question of eye health. There is a lot more that we can, we can carry on to speak on government, but I am also conscious of the time. I, when I was given the subject, I said, oh, that's a long time to speak, but I could speak on this subject, not for 18 minutes. I could speak on this subject for a very long time because it is something I believe in and it is something that I believe is important in providing a transformative moment in the lives of people, over 2 billion people, transformative in the lives of young of women and girls because gender is is is, is the women are the most effect affected by by blindness and it's transformative in the way we deliver education because so many children are in school and cannot be given an opportunity for education because of lack of eye health services lack of glasses just a simple glasses pair of glasses it is transformative because so many persons go needlessly blind because of the lack of services. So because of, of all of those reasons, we can, we got to be advocates, we got to be strong advocates, and we got to link it to something that governments have signed on to, the resolution and the SDGs, and we got to link these things in order to be able to take our campaign into the ministries of health and into the progress of setting up national universal health programs. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Webson. Uh, and uh, we'll take Q&A uh, throughout the, the, uh, the session and we'll just have more discussion at the end. Uh, so now moving on to uh, Caroline Casey. Uh, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, where everybody is. Um, Ambassador Webson, that's not fair. You spoke to the minute and you will shame me now because being Irish, um, I definitely speak a lot. So Paul, I give you full permission. If I run over time, please tell me to stop talking. It's I have no problem with that at all. Um, to do something that we've been doing over the pandemic um, that recognizes an inclusive approach to online conferences, I'm going to audio describe myself for anybody like myself and Ambassador Webson who, has, who is blind or is of low vision. I am a white woman with very white blonde hair. Uh, I'm wearing a very pink shirt kind of candy pink, um, and I have a blurry background. I'm calling in from Italy, where it's 37 degrees, and I hope you're not seeing how hot I am. The blurry background will probably best give you an indication of my vision. I have ocular albinism, and that means I have about one foot of vision. Um, I don't look whatever I've been told over the years. Like people often say, you don't look like you're registered blind and I'm not sure what that is supposed to look like but I come to you today um, and I'm really honoured to be here and I very much thank Prevent Blinds to actually have me here but why am I here? I can't, I'm not a technical expert and I certainly haven't done what Ambassador Webster has done but I come here with a lot of experience 
from different areas, but I come here like you because I'm passionate about this. Preventing avoidable sight loss is so personal. And we heard Ambassador Webson say, you know, it's not a disability issue, it's an eye health issue. Well, it is, it's an, it's an eye health issue. It's a health issue. It's a social issue. It's an economic issue. It's a development issue. It's a human issue. And it is extraordinary to me in 2022 that we are still talking about an issue that we can resolve. And you hear the figures that the ambassador has spoken about and the words that still, I can't help it, but they still give me goosebumps when we say needlessly avoidable sight loss. We have so many issues in this world that we can't resolve. And yes, this, this one, we can. And yet it is one of the greatest blind spots, excuse me to saying it, but it has been. And how it is when every single one of us on this planet have eyes. Some of us have eyes that work better than others. But how we live our life and how we are is determined by the access that we have to eye health care. I come to you today, I am the very, I'm just a year in the role as the president of the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. Something that I can't quite believe that they have given me the honor to do. Um, I'm also a disability activist and advocate and campaigner where I've been doing for 22 years. Um, I'm an Irish woman, I'm a businesswoman, and I'm a troublemaker. I'm the founder also of the Valuable 500, which Paul spoke to. And when you hear that, its whole aim, the Valuable 500, is to end disability exclusion through the power of business, making sure our CEOs and the leaders of the most powerful force on the planet, business, will be accountable and will understand that disability is part of business. When I attempted to create this 500 wide coalition of the world's biggest brands, brands that every one of you know, everybody said that Irish visually impaired woman hasn't a clue what she's doing. And you know something, maybe I didn't. And Bono, the lead singer of U2, an Irish band says, the less you know, the more you believe. And that's how I see it. For me, the only thing that stops change happening, radical change happening, is intention and collective action and collaboration. I think the reason that I have been asked to be the president, maybe it's because the biggest thing about me that you should know is that I'm a troublemaker. And I don't take no for an answer, neither does the ambassador. You've just seen what he has done but none of that, as he has said it in his speech so eloquently, came without an awful lot of diplomacy and pushing and conversation and resilience and tenacity. And today when we speak about this, it's what is all of our role in ending avoidable sight loss in the world. You don't need to be the ambassador. You don't need to be the crazy Irish woman. You don't need to be Richard Branson, is every single one of our actions, whatever sector we come from, whichever passion that we have, it's all the dots that add up. I remember, and I think the reason I talk about this so personally is why I am here, why I am here in this role and why I, you hear the, the, the shake in my voice and the passion that I have, is because I know I wouldn't be here doing the work that I have done around disability exclusion with the education that I have got. The defining factor in my life has been the access to eye health. With my condition, if I was born in a different country in the global south, my life would have been at risk. If I came from a different part of Ireland and I didn't have the chance to get to the health that I had access to and the education, 
I wouldn't have got the chance to be the troublemaking change maker that I hope is a good thing. It is a human issue. And every life that every single one of you changes, whether it's through a rehabilitation, whether it's through education, whether it's through it's a shoulder to cry on, whether it's through surgery, whatever it is, every single one of those lives and every single one of those actions gather together to start creating an unstoppable noise and voice that we need because this is possible. The potential that we can release in ensuring that every individual on this planet has access to the eye health that they require to enable them to reach their fullest potential, whether visually impaired, blind, or enabling them to see if they can. When we look at the IAPB's 2030 Insight, we look at the three things that we want more than anything. They may sound simple, and it's actually ludicrously simple. Three of them that we don't want anybody to have to be blind or visually impaired without due reason. Why would we want that? Secondly, to have access to, to affordable eye health. And thirdly, as a human being, for those of us in privilege and to know that we have the responsibility to look after our eyes. And you know what really makes me angry? When I hear us compete a health issue against a other health issue. Well, we don't put the investment into eye health because somebody's not going to die because they can't see. Well, don't you want then to tell all the leaders in the world to take their glasses off? Well, where would you be if you didn't have your glasses? Would you be in those positions of leadership? No, you wouldn't. Because eye health, as the ambassador has said, is not just simply about our eyes. It's about our family. So for those of us who, my sister and I are visually impaired, it affects our family and it affects the community and then affects the societies that we're in. It affects the productivity and the ability for us to contribute to our society. We know that avoidable sight loss costs up to something, the Lancet said 411 billion. And look at our world today and look how much we need every single one of us being having a sense of pride and being able to contribute. In the US alone, it's 51.1 billion, really? Like, why are we turning that blind eye? It's about a sense of dignity and respect. I hear so many times as my own journey of coming out of the blind closet, which I did 22 years ago, I hid my sight loss for fear of not being able to be the human being I wanted, to not be able to fulfill the potential that I had. So when I say this story matters, and I come from such privilege that if I was scared to own my sight loss, that shows where the sight loss and understanding was back there 20 years ago. So when we hear about the resolution that the ambassador led to come to fruition, this is so important. It's not discretionary. It's not an and to think of. It is essential because every one of us has two eyes. This connects to everything. There's very few issues on this planet that every one of us has the understanding of. When I was diagnosed with ocular albinism in 1971, which is me telling you my age, thank gosh I can't see my smile lines because I'm 50, um, my parents were terrified. What did that mean? So they brought me up as a sighted child, knowing that the world didn't actually accept blindness and vision impairment. My father was a lover of Johnny Cash, a, joy, uh, a boy named Sue, that song. And he knew that the world was tough. So he thought denying me the truth meant that I would be strong and I would be resilient as all human beings are. And it was at 17 years old I discovered about my sight condition when I went to get my driving license, which is a complete joke. Anyway, when I found out that I had this condition, I was 17 years old and it's very different today. If I found out I had a vision impairment today in the month of disability pride, just so you know, disability pride is in the world today. It wasn't back then. I hid my disability because where I wanted to go, 
I didn't know if the world wanted me. And I hid there for 11 years. I went through university because I was privileged to have a good education, hiding my sight. And I went to be an archeologist, not a great idea for somebody vision impaired. And then I ended up in the corporate world with a global consultancy firm. And I hid that condition because disability was not welcome in the corporate world. And actually of all the disabilities, funnily people imagine that if you're vision impaired, you can't be of any value. So it was in 2000 that I came out of the closet about being visually impaired because I had damaged my sight because I hadn't taken care of it. I had reduced the vision that I had a further 30%. And that was needless. And that was fear of acceptance. When I think back now to that 22 years ago and the work that I have done over the years, you know what? I don't think I ever would have achieved the work I have done if I wasn't visually impaired. And owning that as a mark of my identity and with pride. And the world is changing. It is changing when we see fabulous advocates with disability and vision impairment standing up and owning it and actually creating solutions and insights for the world. When I work with business, I keep reminding them, did you know that you know, the remote control, something that we all used, was designed for visually impaired people to watch television? But that's the good side, right? Today, I just want to say to each and every one of you, this idea that we could create a world where all of us, all of us together, each of the work that we do could end avoidable sight loss. Is it possible? It is. But I do want to say there are days where you feel like the work we do, it's endless and it doesn't feel like we can achieve it. I had one of those days today around disability. And I was thinking, gosh, this is sometimes it just doesn't feel like you can, <laughs> you can get over that hill. And just before I came on the call, I had two of our team members say to me differently, just they had no idea I was having a bad disability day. Thank you for giving me the job that I have because I know I'm doing something good. And I just want to remind everybody who is working from the ambassador to Paul, to everybody who's working around sight loss, sight prevention, rehabilitation, people who are hustling in the UN, people who are working with ministries, people who actually endlessly and ceaselessly try to ensure there's a world that is a level playing field and equity for all. I really wanna say thank you because I truly know the position that I'm in that I would never be here doing the work that I do if I didn't have the access to the eye health that I have. I hope that I will now work with the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness on what I believe is a strategy that is transformative. This strategy 2030 insight is standing on the shoulders of giants of, of the 2020 strategy. Look at what the ambassador has just said. Look what they have, look what we have just done. Look at the framework of the sustainable development goals. There is no competition over health. There is no competition over exclusion. The thing that we will do together is what will ensure that we will achieve something that others think is impossible. With the strategy that we have, it's not just about the organizations, it's about every one of us. Every one of us using our voice, our voice because of our eyes, because every one of us knows at some point it could be our eyes that no longer work as well. It's future proofing our world for everyone and it's future proofing our world for ourselves. This issue of avoidable sight loss is not just in the eye health sector. It's not just the ophthalmologists. It's every single one of us. It's every single one who cares that they get a chance to be in the world as they want to be. And that is important. We now need to raise the game and talk to the employers in ensuring that we have eye tests as employees come in, ensuring that the education system can track and see where eye health is in our young children. We need to ensure, as Ambassador has said, that eye health is integrated. This is not a disability issue, but it can be a disability issue. And as I am an advocate for disability, 
it is hard enough for the 1.3 billion people who are advocating on an inequitable and socially just world. Why wouldn't we needlessly allow people become disabled? This is in our power. And if you are sometimes thinking that the work you do is exhausting, please know that every single piece that we do together is working towards this. This can change. And I said at the very beginning, there are two things in the way of change, the intention and the will and collaborative and radical action. Wherever we are in the world and whatever we do, please just today for a moment, will you be proud of the piece that you are putting into that jigsaw of the unstoppable force that can end something needless, preventable, avoidable side loss. And for us, let's hope I, I'm 50. I don't know if it's going to be a generation when I'm gone, but that we see our children and our great grandchildren and our great grandchildren grow in a world where they can see and be who they are. I think Helen Keller probably says it better than everyone. It's alone we can do only one thing, but together we can do so much. And I think this time, this pandemic has proved our interconnectedness. And let's not forget that. So for me, just to say thank you, I'm here to serve as the president and I look forward to hearing from you. Ab absolutely fantastic, Caroline, and, uh, and right on time. <laughs> but <laughs> truly, yeah, tr truly inspirational, um, Ambassador Epson and, and, and Miss Casey. I mean, really incredible talks and a lot of wonderful comments from, from the, uh, the attendees. Uh, so just as a reminder, um, please put your Q&A in the Q&A box. Uh, there's a number of questions that have already come in. Um, let's, let's start uh, with, with this one, um, which I think is, is terrific you know, after Caroline's talk, but what do you think are the primary barriers to establishing universal eye health care? Is it purely financial? Is it political? Uh, is it a dearth of providers? Uh, so, Carolyn, why don't you get start with that, and we'll ask Dr., uh, Ambassador Webson as well. Well, I think Ambassador Webson is absolutely far greater equipped to, an, equipped to answer that question. I often believe, particularly when the work that we do around disability, I think put our differences aside, truly. Um, for me, the greatest barrier, well, there's two great ones. One is people holding their own agendas and not finding the commonality because I actually believe that it's through the different, our same difference that we will find that way. And I don't care whether it's through politics or the private sector or the NGO sector or whatever, but we actually have to find a way to work together. And if we don't do that, then we're just gonna be fighting each other. So that to me is the greatest barrier. But I do think the greatest opportunity, honestly, um, and maybe this is because you've got to remember, I can't be objective in the sense that I truly believe that business needs to be part of this solution. It truly does. We need to look at markets. We need to look at regulation. Um, and, you know, business can't just stand aside uh, and, and not be involved in this. Uh, it's a very, very important aspect, but we have to do it in a way, and I know we can, that is meaningful to business and is meaningful to society. So they're my two pieces. And I guess always, and I don't know what the ambassador would say, is just stop us, what I say, problem gazing like adoring the problem, like let's just get on with the solution and agree how we're gonna to work together to make that possible. I thank you, Carolyn, and Caroline, and fabulous presentation indeed. Um, I will agree with you with the three points you put forward. Clearly there is an issue of silo or siloism, where everyone, private sector and others, try to work on an issue themselves because we are all competing. So I think that's something we have to, we have the sector have to address and civil society, has, which I think has been making a lot of efforts recently to open up that corridor has to continue. But I think the biggest challenge for I, the eye health sector and, and the biggest challenge we face with eye health 
broad acceptance into universal health is a political one. But it's political because it, it, it has some history. The eye health sector has always, as I said earlier, been talked about it to itself about blindness prevention. And it had it became an issue, uh, it became more of an issue where the civil society drove the agenda, even though they did their best effort to involve government. The fact that they were linking it to charity and the fact that they were doing it so much by themselves, I believe why governments just weren't hearing it and seeing it. You also have to recall that when you do it in that way, then it's competing with a number of other issues, other challenges, other, other, other national challenges. And as some people have told me before in my former life dealing with this subject, going blind won't kill you, but there are diseases that do. So if you link eye health to the overall structure of community health, universal health, and you link it to the things we are talking about now, economics, education, and so on, you then recognize that there is more opportunity to get it into universal health. It must also be linked to the, the, to the aging process because most people who are aging are going to have high health challenges and it must be seen within the context of services for persons who are in the elderly and, and needing that service as well. And, and therefore that, that to me, the political will, the political engagement, and that's why the resolution from the UN is so important. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and, you know, and moving on along the lines of what you just discussed and, and implementation. Uh, so one of the questions uh, came in uh, asking, are there any models or suggestions for how state and local governments in the US, you know, and I would say even ex-US, you know, can implement the, the site components of the SDGs? So maybe Ambassador Webson, since you're on, you know, you talked about the SDGs, you know, could you comment on this and then move on to Caroline? I do not know of any models because I have not been in the field to examine the models. But what, what, is, what is interesting here is now that there is the resolution, every year, um, a number of countries, and this year there are 45 countries who are asked to present uh, the, voluntarily, they present their, 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 their status on their SDGs. And uh, we are now able, using the resolution, to ask people to include in their, in their status update the situation of eye health. So we should learn, and the beginning this year, we should be learning more about, <clears throat> excuse me, more about the status of eye health as it relates to the fulfillment of the SDGs. So give us a little time and we should be able to come back on that. Caroline, what do you think? I'm smiling. Uh, I love the, I love how honest the ambassador is because it's like give us a little time. You're absolutely right. Like this, the, the resolution has just been passed, and I couldn't agree with him more. That what we can learn now from what different countries are doing is hugely important. Um, it's just this is a question. Actually, you got to remember, I'm not a technical expert. I also don't come from America. I'm Irish, so I I think. There's two places, there's two intervention points, and I'd love to hear what others have to say is, it seems to me if we can get these two points around understanding people's eye health at the very beginning of going into education, the next layer at teenage years, and also then at our employee level. That to me is, can we not, and I, I really hear what the ambassador is saying, is integrating 
eye health into other systems, into what is being done, not another add on, because that's when people go, oh, my God, it's another thing we've got to do. So what are the points that we can integrate? And I think for me, it's education and, uh, and the, the employment system. But there's also one other thing that I was dying to pop in my hand, just as the ambassador was saying it around age. I don't know, are many of us aware of the recent statistic that by 2030, our sustainable development goals, that anything between 60 to 80% of the wealth in our world is being controlled by people who are 60 and over, right? And that is, you know, a place where our eyes don't get to work so much. It's, just, it's a time and point. So this is also another opportunity to make it very, very relevant. I mean, I think that's what they call the baby boomers, but like that isn't really important. Follow the money as well. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think the linkage is important. The linkage mm. between all of the intersectoral points on the SDGs, which you report on in your VNR, your voluntary, um, your voluntary presentations to the to the to the, the, the United Nations, the linkages of, of that and, and eye health is going to be the thing we will be following. And what you can do in the audience is make sure that when your government is reporting on their BNRs, that they indicate the eye health status based on the resolution. And I, I, you know, you know, Carolyn, you said follow the money, right? So which, which brings up the, the question of incentivization, right? So, you know, one of the questions that came in was, you know, how do we recruit and incentivize eye health providers to serve in rural communities where resources may be lacking and there may not be as much financial incentive? Ambassador, do you want to take that one? I mean, give me give me two seconds for my head to think because I don't want to say something and it'd be ridiculous. Well, well, for me, I am focusing again on 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 not and and I come from a developing country, okay, and I've spent most of my life's work in a developing country. So yeah. I am focusing not on specialization. So we say the eye health provider can't be served in a, develop, in, a, in a rural community because they don't have the resources and so on and so on. But if eye health was not seen as an isolated in, in, its own, in its own silo, you wouldn't have that problem. You would be speaking about health teams because that's what universal health does. You would be speaking about the teams and on that team would be eye health provider. So, mm -hmm. so and, and, and then you would know where the intersect for specialization comes. So I, I think we have to, our first challenge is getting out of the box of siloing eye health into its own corners and bringing it, if you really want it in universal health, bring it into the UP so that we can, we can, we can do the, 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 the assessment together. And that the, let me give you a simple example. One of the big causes in developing countries of, of blindness is diabetes. Mm -hmm. And diab and everybody who goes into to, to to measure for the diabetes in the diabetes clinic should be able to have an eye, and should, their eyes should be tested at the same time. So you don't have to create a new corner for that. It should be part of the assessment for diabetes. Okay, you go in for child health, child health assessment, and you know that in some countries nutritional blindness. You know that. Uh, congenital glaucoma and so on and so on. And you need to put all of that into the health package, not into a separate basket. And I'm going to then take the other side of it um, and say, for me, there's a piece, when we look at what the IAPB is, is looking at and, and how we do this strategy, we're talking about elevating the conversation and the responsibility um, of eye health you know, elevating this as an issue and integrating it to what the ambassador is saying constantly, this, this issue of integration, and then making sure that we can activate right across all our different sectors. For me, you've got to, to get people to want to work in a particular area, regardless of where we are, it has to hold importance and have purpose and meaning. And I do think there's a whole piece that we are now really coming together to, to, promote the importance of this work 
the importance and the meaning of this work at the macro level and at a micro level. And I think that's that's another piece that can support that. The integration is important, but we've got to be talking about the importance of these roles and this job and, and, and the work that people do, which hasn't really had the prominence that it should have. Hey, Miss Casey, Ambassador Webson, um, we are so grateful to, to have had you with us. Um, I can't tell you how many people have commented on, on how inspirational your stories are and how much people appreciated um, your personal reflection. Um, you are incredible change makers and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul from Bangkok, you too for staying up late. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you thank everyone. You.